Today's title is called Wealth and Worry. You might think, well, those two things don't go together. Yes, they do, because you know and I know that we wake up worrying about wealth all the time, about 4.30 in the morning, about where it's going to come from and how we're going to pay the bills. And, and uh, we like to think that we don't worry, and, and wealth isn't a big deal. But I want to say to you, whether you have a lot of money or whether you don't have a lot of money, I think money is a big deal. It's a big deal to Jesus. And uh, we're going to see that uh, this morning. Back in 1928... Republican candidate by the name of Herbert Hoover, almost a century ago, was running for the President of the United States. His byline for his candidacy read like this, wages, progress, dividends, and prosperity say vote Hoover. There'll be a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage was the uh, presidential slogan. (laughs) And uh, some of you took history classes, remember those words. (laughs) That was his promise. Now, that was 1928. He went on to win that election, landslide victory, over his Democratic opponent. But something happened in 1929. What was that? A little, mm. little stock market crash? Yeah, the, the Great Depression. Depression. The Great Depression. And rather than a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage, there were soup lines in every major city of the U.S. as our government tried to just keep people from starving to death. So it doesn't always turn out the way we would like it. It doesn't always turn out the way we think it will, the way we plan it. So Jesus is going to talk about money. Yeah, if you're here thinking like, oh, it's church. They talk about money a lot. Uh, Yeah, listen, that's that's, uh, biblical, actually, because Jesus talked about it a lot. About 15% of everything he said could be tied back specifically to money. He talked about money more than he talked about your sexuality, more than he talked about uh, heaven or hell. He, he tied in this idea of money because he knew there was the, the, these strings that attach to our finances, that attach to our wealth, are connected to a lot of other stuff. And if you want to get to that other stuff, you go, you go that direction. Uh, matter of fact, he said in Matthew 19, this is going to be one of those hard sayings of Jesus. This isn't the Sermon on the Mount. We're jumping forward here. But he says this. He says, again, I tell you, It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you've ever tried to put a thread through the eye of a needle, you know that's hard. So how much harder is it to stick a camel through there? It sounds nearly impossible. And it's easy to say, "Uh, well, you know, we could look in Timothy and see other places where what he's really talking about is the, the love of money. And indeed, he does talk about the love of money. But here, he's just talking about money. Not even the love of it, but the effect that money has on our life and how quickly it does things to our spiritual life. And right about now, I'd like to cue that Pink Floyd bass line, you know, doom, doom, do that song. Uh, maybe you're too, old, too young to remember that. Uh, Pink Floyd. Uh, money is a big deal. <laughs> Only an old person would remember that. Uh, I'm sorry, it was random. I don't even know it, and I'm... <laughs> Can't get any hipper. <laughs> <laughs> wealth is influence. Wealth is power. If you look around our world today, you look at what people do for wealth. I mean, seriously, you look mm-hmm. at what people do for the accumulation of wealth. They're, it breaks up families, separates marriages, causes people to, to betray other people, murder, and, and violence, robbery. Mm-hmm. Prisons are full all across this country of people who are in that prison because of the going after money in an illegal way. Money has the power, again, to separate close families. Just, you know, look around, talk to people who had to deal with an inheritance. And so money has power. This is what Jesus is trying to get across, I think, in this passage. And money is, it it can kill you. That's what we just read. Money can keep you out of the kingdom of God. A lot of people will read that scripture we just read about the eye of the needle and say, well, Jesus was talking about the love of money. Excuse me, it doesn't say that. So he, I'm not saying that because you're wealthy, you're excluded from the kingdom, but what Jesus was saying is, listen, there's power in that stuff, and anything's possible with God. In fact, he, in, in context, he would say, well, how can anyone be saved? The disciples said, he said, well, all things are possible with God. But he's recognizing the power of this thing. On the other hand, money has also the power to bless others. Money has the power to relieve suffering. Money has the power to bless the poor, to feed and clothe the naked and and so on and so forth. So it all depends on how we view money and that's what we're going to look at. So Jesus says in Matthew 7, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy 
where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hmm. Treasure is an interesting word, especially right now around Christmas time. Think about you know, when you were a kid or if you have kids, how you could long for something. You want it so bad, you hope it's under there, and then you get it. And how long does that thing really hold your attention? That tr- the thing you've treasured, you've wanted so bad, and then before long, it's just another old toy. It's just another thing that you wanted, and now you have, and you're on to the next thing. The definition of treasure is this, or way of seeing it, is a casket or coffer in which good, valuable, and precious things are collected and laid up. Think King Tut's tomb, right? Uh, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when uh, they brought all the treasures of King Tut's tomb to America and went on a tour through all the cities. And I, was fat, I remember reading in National Geographic, I was fascinated with that. All this gold, all this amazing amount of wealth and the way they lived. All someone laying up something that he thought would do him good in the next life. And yet inside of that tomb was a dead body. Not a risen savior and none of that went with him into eternity. Jesus ends that previous passage with, he says, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. So wherever that accumulation of stuff is, whatever that is, we'll unpack that. But he said, that's, your heart's going to go there with it. And then he, he in a sense, he says something here that seems a little bit, uh, a little bit of a, a left turn, but it's not. It goes right in hand in glove with what he's talking about. He said, if the eye is the, la- the, eye is the lamp of the body, your, the way you see life, the way your, your worldview is the lamp of your body, if your view of the world is healthy, and, the, and there's, this is like a play on words in the Greek. This word healthy means generous. If your eye is healthy, if your eye is generous, if you have a generous outlook on life, your whole body will be full of generosity. However, if your eyes are unhealthy, and this was a word that they would use to describe stingy, narrow, just narrow, if your eye is stingy, your whole body will be stingy and full of darkness. And he said, and if that light that was in you, if, if, you, if that light you think is light is within you, oh, how great is that darkness. You don't realize how dark your life really is because it's a stingy heart that you're living your life through. And it directly ties this to who we serve, to who our God is when he says, no one can serve two masters. You're either going to hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Money is mammon. Mammon is the confidence that wealth brings. So as we unpack this this morning, Jesus seems to be recognizing, he's not sweeping under the carpet, the idea that money has power on the earth, that money actually speaks to people, it rules people's decisions. Money talks, money talks to us. I've heard my wallet talk to me, right? We're smiling when someone comes up and we're taking an offering and part of your heart says, I really should give. And you look in your wallet and says, no, no, you shouldn't (laughs) put that back. Do you realize there's bills to be paid next week? Do you realize they've already taken an offering once? Do you realize? And so your wallet, sometimes I want to do something if I want to be generous or I want to do something for somebody. And again, money will tell me logically or whatever what what I can or can't do or should or shouldn't do. And and Jesus is saying, listen, um, there's power in both. I rule and money rules its, its area of the kingdom. I've allowed it sovereignly to have some power for the season. But he said, you can't serve both. He, he just, he, he, this is one of the most cut to the chase, blow away all the smoke and all the mirrors and the fog. And Jesus says, listen, you are either going to love one and hate the other, or you're going to, dis, you know, devoted to one and despise the other, but you cannot give your heart to both. So you're thinking, well, gosh, what does that mean? Does that mean we never have any money? Does that mean we're, we just make ourselves poor? No, not at all, because uh, I've been around people who have no money that are just as greedy or greedier than people who have lots of money. It's not a question of quantity. Mm-hmm. It's really a question of, of my heart, which direction my heart is facing, and then the behavior that follows my heart. And so what does it look like to serve? Well, I mean, to serve money. Because uh, I think... 
I think there's a sense in which the American dream is, I want to quit working for my money, and I want my money to start working for me. You ever heard that? Right? That's a great idea. And I'm not, I'm not really even against the idea. The idea is, hey, if I get enough money and put it in this place, then I could get this magical thing I keep hearing about that other people get called compound interest. And then I'm living, my money's making money. That's a dream come true. My money's making money. They're like, I finally turned money into rabbits. They're just going to multiply. Mm. And, and, and that's a valid thing that people do to accumulate wealth. But let me tell you that not putting your heart there the scripture says is a pretty hard thing to do. That after that happens, there's, there's something that also takes place in our heart that we're trying to get it to serve us, but, but really we're serving it. We're serving it. And that is an idol with a bottomless pit for a stomach because it never feels like enough. How much money is enough money? The answer is just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Why? Because what you haven't got is contentment. Mm. Contentment isn't a dollar amount. You know what contentment is? Contentment is closing a circle. Mm. And this is something that very few people I meet actually have even thought of or actually do. In other words, when I say closing a circle, is there a quantity that you could say, with this much money, I am Comfortable and secure, because this is what money promises, right? Money promises comfort, security, and and so it, it's again this bottomless pit. Because how much comfort is enough comfort? How much security is enough security? I'm gonna I'm gonna provide for you. I'm gonna. This is the the whole thing with the treasure. The the pharaohs and the and the and and the rulers would think. I'm going into the next life, so I'm going to carry my wealth with me to provide influence and security when I get into this new life. I'm not going to start from scratch, right? And so I think in the same way, in, in our culture today, there's this sense of money provides security of position or power or, or influence or something like that. But be careful. Jesus, in fact, was uh, called upon to mediate a dispute about an inheritance. It's recorded in the book of Luke. Curious story. Someone in the crowd says to him, now we don't know who it is, a faceless guy, nameless guy, teacher, he grabs Jesus and says, my brother and I are in a fight about the inheritance, so tell him to divide it with me. And Jesus just, this almost just this right back at you, who made me an arbitrator for you? And, and trying to figure out your, own, your, your guys' greed. Hmm. And then he turns and takes that, we don't know what happened with that guy, but Jesus wasn't taking the bait. Jesus, you're on my side. Come on, religion's on my side. Isn't that interesting? He's calling on the Son of God to help him pull the wealth. Come on, Jesus, pull some strings because I want part of the wealth my brother won't share with me. You don't hear a lot of com dripping compassion towards the brother. Mm -hmm. Where there's a will, there's a relative. <laughs> and so what you find is this wealth, all of a sudden now, has divided this family. And Jesus uses this opportunity and turns and, and sort of, he tells a parable, but he gives a warning first. He says, look out, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed because your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. Mm -hmm. Watch out, he says, he warns us. We would do well to listen to his warning. Look out, watch it, watch it. Your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. You know, there's a, there's a disease in our culture that's a very real thing. And I'm not a psychologist, but it's called hoarding. Mm -hmm. It's called people who fill their homes and their campers and their storage units with stuff. Mm -hmm. Because somewhere in the accumulation of that stuff is some measure of comfort and some measure of security. Hey, do you have an extension cord? Well, actually, I have a whole case of extension cords right here. <laughs> I bought nine of them when they were on sale, 1985. Hmm. Do you have a gun in the house? Whoa, I have a whole safe full of guns in the house. What kind of gun are you looking for? Hmm. Hey, have you ever collected any gold coins? Whoa, gold coins. Hey, you. And Jesus said, look out. Be careful. And he says, and, he, and then he turns and tells a story. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest, and he thought to himself, huh, what will I do because this has gone beyond what I thought I needed to live? I have a barn, and I have a house, and I have a living, and my bills are being paid, but man, I, I hit the jackpot this year. 
I, I, whatever it is, I got the bonus, won the lottery, doubled up on the money, made a good investment, and he says, what will I do? I have no place to store all the excess. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store up all that surplus. And now watch the, uh, the, the heart that Jesus is describing. And I will say to myself, as I sit in my recliner, you know, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, you fool. Because this very night your life will be demanded from you and then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? And then he brings it home to us because he's trying to get something across to, to us. He says, this is what it will be like for whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. It's a sobering story. But Jesus is doing it because he's trying to awaken us to the danger. Isn't that amazing? What one brother's asking for is uh, justice and a redistribution of wealth. Hmm. Do those sound like familiar topics right now? And that not all anybody wants to talk about is justice and redistribution of wealth and, and our particular idea of what that should look like. And what Jesus is saying here is you're not gonna be content with that. I can move bank accounts around and do whatever you think needs to be done and that still won't be a number that brings contentment in your life. You're still gonna hunger and thirst for more because you have eternity in your heart and so no temporal thing will fill that hole. No temporal thing will make you feel good enough because you're always going to be looking for something eternal and as long as you try to make this little thing, this temporary thing, the ultimate thing, you've made that thing an idol and the thing that we tend to do that the most with is money. We turn that into an idol and what that actually multiplies in our life is not contentment but worry. We worry then over it, over and over and over again. We can't stop worrying. We are an anxious society, and there is no drug that will take that away. That makes me worry just talking about it. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever had, when you were younger, an old beater car? Maybe all of us had at least one, maybe more than one. I had a couple. And you know, when you got an old beater car and you pull into the parking lot at Walmart, I don't care where I park. Sure, ding it up. And then all of a sudden you get enough money to get a new car and you're like, no, no, no. I'm parking like four blocks down here because I don't want anybody to ding my door, right? I love going to Home Depot because you can see the construction guys that have like, their truck is 10 years old, they're parked yeah. right up front. They actually they, use it for construction. The guy, the guy with the brand new <laughs> F1 million, you know, he's parked out, taking up three spaces sideways, right? He's got armed guards standing there. Who do you think's more content with their purchase? Yeah. This is the malady of humankind, man. The eyes of man, Proverbs said, the king said, are never satisfied. So God knew something about us that Pastor Jason mentioned. He said, listen, I have made you for eternity, but there's a cheap counterfeit that's going to come down the pipes your way, promising you something that only I can provide. And now Jesus, in this passage, He's going to talk about worry. He's going to mention it five times in just a few verses. When, when God mentions something five times in, in a few verses, we need to pay attention. And here's what he says. Therefore, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Those are the basic necessities that Baloo sang about, right? And is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. You ever seen like a worried bird, right? Jesus is saying, and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? Can any one of you by worrying add one thing, one hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the fields grow? They don't labor or spin. I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like these. And if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow burned in the fire, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? So, do not worry. What shall we eat, drink, or wear? And then he drops the bombshell. He says, because that's what pagans do. That's what people without God do. They just spend their years and spend their lives worrying. 
He said that's the mark of, of an orphan. That's the mark of someone without a father. That's the mark of someone who just feels vulnerable all the time. He said their life is marked by worry. Now listen, I'm not here. To, listen, please track with me here. Um, I, I don't want it to be this, this condemning thing, mm-hmm. but, but worry is anti-faith. The just shall live by faith. Worry is the opposite of faith. And sometimes I think we feel like, well, you know, if you had my life, you'd be worried too. Maybe. But if we're honest, all of us have stuff. First of all, all of us have bills and all of us have challenges and some of us have more debt than others, but there's plenty to worry about. There's plenty to go around. But Jesus is saying, listen, the mark of a fatherless son or daughter is just this thing of worry. And most, you know, I don't know about you, I, I've, I've done my time wrestling with worry. And I want to tell you, I'm here to tell you that 97% of what I've worried about never actually came to pass. But boy, it sure consumed a lot of my sleep and a lot of my time, a lot of my energy. And Jesus is saying, listen, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given unto you as well. And one more time, in case you didn't hear me, he says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow is going to worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Mm. And I say amen to that. <laughs> you know the difference between how this can be condemning or not condemning is uh, if, if I hear your problems, if I hear like, I don't know how I'm going to make mortgage this month, and I just go, oh man, don't worry, and walk away, <laughs> that's condemning because I haven't entered into your problem, right? I've just told you not to worry. I haven't actually done anything about it. If I say, hey, I'm here, I wanna help, don't worry. That, that's not condemning at all, isn't it? That's encouraging, that makes me feel like oh, I'm not alone. What God is telling us is, listen, kids, you're not alone. He's not just telling us not to worry and then leaving us alone. He's entering into the problem. He's entered into our time and space through his son, Jesus Christ. And he's here to say, don't worry. That's, that is a beautiful thing. Now, though, it's really important to remember here, don't worry doesn't mean no bad thing will happen to you. That's not what's being said here. Bad things can still happen to us. The difference is we recognize that no matter what happens to me, I have a security that goes beyond my bank account. I have an eternal security. There is someone out there that has a place for me, right? There is a place that has been prepared for me. I have, people, when they had less, understood this more. That's the truth. And we would sing about it in church. This world is not my home. I'm only passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Mm -hmm. Cue the slide guitar. Come on, man. Come on, Dan. And I'm telling you, the poor of the country, the poor of the community, the poor, the more they understand what they have laid up for them in heaven. Isn't it crazy? Those of you in this room, maybe not everybody, but many of you in this room will relate to what I'm going to say. There's been seasons in your life when you've come to the end of yourself. Mm -hmm. You've come to the end of your strength. You've come to the end of your resources, the end of all the stuff you had stashed away. And you don't know what to do. And it's in those places that God showed up for you. Mm -hmm. And change happened in your life. Sometimes the biggest transformation in your life happened in those moments. Mm -hmm. I'd be willing to bet there'd be a dozen people in this room that would stand up right now and say, amen, that's me. That it (laughs) it didn't happen until I got. We got at least two. (laughs) And so what kind of father wouldn't want to strip away all the Mm -hmm. false, all the counterfeit security so Mm -hmm. that we would know him better? Now, in the natural, do I want that to happen? Of course not. Mm -hmm. Of course not. I love comfort. Mm -hmm. Listen to the definition of security. Security is not the freedom from, from want or harm or loss. Freedom is, or security is the freedom from the fear of. That's a very critical distinction. Mm-hmm. It's freedom from this fear that would want to dominate my life, that would want to make me stingy and small, that would want to keep me up at four in the morning, worried about things I can't possibly change anyway. Mm-hmm. It would make me grumpy and make me narrow and make my life dark. It's the freedom from the fear that God promises. Listen, I'll take care of you. Isn't it crazy that I've been, yesterday at South Campus, we buried a man who was 33 years of age. I've never been with anybody in all my years of ministry at the end of their life in the hospital or on their deathbed that wanted me to check the stock market one more time before they passed or drive the Mercedes by one more time, I want to make sure it's clean or... or uh, uh, 
you know, no, no one ever looks for that stuff. Why? Because they're about to transition from one reality to another, a greater reality. So listen to the word of God in Hebrews, God's admonition towards us. He says, listen, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. So there's this eternal, untouchable by moths and rot and thieves promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. So now you can say as you live your years on the earth with confidence. Now you can say in dark times and troubling times, now you can say when all hell rages against you, when your family thinks you're crazy, when you've lost your job, now you can say when the economy crashes, now you can say, Lord's my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Hmm. If this feels foreign to you, I want to encourage you to look at the life of Paul. Do, do a study in the life of Paul and, and check out his life. Because honestly, he, he understood this in a way that I've, I've never seen anywhere else. You could, they would literally strip him and beat him. They took everything that could be taken from a man, they took from him. Everything that can be taken from a man was taken from Paul. And he said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He had a security in a home, in a place. It was it, it, just like in Hebrews 11, there was a city that was just out there, just out of sight, whose builder and maker was God. And he was living for that city. For that city. I run into people like that sometimes. I run into them. I, I ran into one on Wednesday. And it blew me away. I mean, I get it. But when you see someone who's several miles down the road from you, you're like, I want to talk to you for a while. I want to find out what's going on in your life, that you can walk away from what you've walked away from. You can do what you do and have more contentment than anyone I have ever met. They have an understanding of the eternal, of, a, of an eternal security. When we lived in Arkansas, it cracks me up. There was a place down there, there was a bank. It made me laugh. They had a billboard up. This only works in the Bible Belt because they understand it down there. But the bank had a, had a billboard that said, uh, the closest thing to eternal security this side of heaven. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that, that's a Bible Belt bank. You won't see that around here. No one would get the joke. <laughs> but when 2008 hit, that bank closed. All right? I mean, it was a cute joke, but they couldn't fulfill the promise. The only one that can fill the Fulfill the promise is your heavenly father. Jesus' words again, for these things the pagans run after. As a pastor, whenever I teach, whenever we teach on money, I can feel it in the room. I can feel it in my guts. There's tension. Because everybody's got a story about how money wasn't done right or how this or that or well, you know, church, oh, you know, religion, oh, you know, Christians, oh, that, all this, all this past stuff. But Jesus tells this story, he puts it in this particular context because it's not a money problem. Listen to me, it's a God problem. Mm -hmm. It's not a money issue. If you have an issue with money, that could be an issue, but that's not the issue. The issue is God, you and God. The issue is who's my father? The issue is where's my supply? You have a problem letting go of money. You don't have. You do have a. You have a problem on one level, but you may be stingy. You may be fearful or whatever. But ultimately, I want to say to you this morning: if you don't walk away with anything else, I want to say to you that please don't look to solve that issue alone because it'll be a vain exercise. You have a God problem, and you have to go back to Him and take it up with Him. Will He provide for me? Is everything I own belong to Him, or am I just kind of tipping God? Every once in a while, here comes the bucket, and I'm going to tip God, right? And God says, no, listen, you know, in the Old Testament, now, if you're kind of new to Christianity here this morning, just track with me real quick. Uh, in the Old Testament, there was a practice called tithing, and the tithe 
was something that God put into motion because he had a group of people he was trying to train to trust him. They were called the Israelites. And he said to the Israelites, you're my people. I've got a purpose for you. I'll take care of you. I'll protect you from your enemies. I'll prosper you. I'll, if, if you'll just walk with me, if you'll let me be your father, man, things will go well with you on the earth. I will prosper you in every way. You got to read part of the Old Testament to get that, but that was the gist of it. God had a people that he was trying to get to learn to trust him. Now, of course, they were just like us, and they had struggles, and they were surrounded by enemies, and they were filled with fear, and they had moments of brilliance, and they had moments of disaster. Mm -hmm. And they hit the skids in one part of their existence, and and, and the tithe God brought in. Now, God wasn't up there going, gosh, I'm just short on cash this week, and so I really need you to give. And Bob, if you don't give, I'm not going to be able to take care of Mark. So Bob, come on, cough up to 10% because I don't have anything to take. Listen, God is not up there. Newsflash, God doesn't need one cent of what you or I have. Not one cent. God doesn't need a million or one. He doesn't need anything we have. It's about us. It's about he's trying to teach us. And so he said, take this 10% and I'm going to use it to take care of the priesthood. I'm going to create a temple and I'm going to create a place where the heathen can come by and see my presence and experience my glory. And and if you'll just do this and just work with me, this is, I'm going to show you who I am and you're going to discover. And of course, they couldn't do it. And Malachi, you get to the end of the Old Testament, this prophet, one of the last in line, finally, one of the last things God says to his people is, look, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. Yet you ask, how are we robbing you in Malachi chapter 3? And God says, in tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, the whole nation, because you're robbing me. He said, bring this tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then God says, listen, just test me. You know, there's not many places in the Old Testament where God says, you can test me. In fact, most of those are not good, those, those were not good things. Mm-hmm. But God says, I will let you test me in this. He said, if there will not be room in my house, he said, I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Mm -hmm. It's God's promise. What he's calling, he's trying to teach these people. You're people of a generous God. And when you imitate my generosity... You, you proclaim my generosity in the earth. You proclaim who is your, you proclaim that you're not living in fear to a system, fear to a government, fear to a bank, fear to a stock market, that I'm your source. Do we have to deal with all those things? Sure. If you have stocks and savings and retirement, that's not the issue. But what he's talking about is who's your dad? Come on, who's your security here? Now, here's, here's some interesting stats. As of 2015, this last year, only 10 to right around the average is actually about 14% of a normal congregation gives on a regular basis. 14%. So if there's 200 people in this room, that means a little less than 30 actually would ever give to this place you call home on a regular basis. According to the national statistics. That's, that, that means I've factored that into my life. Not like, oh, I'm here uh, it's been five Sundays since I've been here, and I'll put something in the bucket. That's like, no, I've made a plan, and I give. The next one uh, is, is tithers, people who like this Old Testament idea, but that people have said, hey, I want to I wanna carry that into my life, that I'm going to give some sort of a, a tithe to the church, and that percentage is, uh, is a little bit different. Only 5% in the U.S. tithe. 80% of Americans only giving 2% of their income. Christians are giving at a 2.5% per capita in 2015. During the Great Depression, they gave it 3.3. In the lowest economic time of our country, Christians were more generous with their money than in the current day we're in. And listen, I want to tell you, I didn't put it up there, but if you look this up and then go figure in the millennials, I'm sorry, but you guys come in even lower. It's even lower. So... And I hope that challenges you. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying, hey, this is about, oh, this is like this ploy for us to to, to, to get more. But listen to me. We we have to kind of come to grips with this because it's a big deal to God. I was, um, you know, the tithe thing, and we're going to quickly close here. The worship team can come up. The tithe thing, uh, I believe, is an Old Testament practice. But, But I believe... We're called now to a level of generosity and giving that outshines the Old Testament. 
Mm-hmm. See, for some people, 10% is, is, is getting off the hook easy. I tell the story of being down in Mexico many years ago and we were trying to help this orphanage get off the ground. We had last week, I mentioned 40, 45 kids and, and uh, this guy came on the property. He was a businessman. Obviously, he had some money and we were showing him around. He had an interest in what we were doing. And uh, I was with this other guy who was the administrator and his name was Russ and we were talking and this guy, after about an hour walking around the place seeing these kids, he turns and looks at Russ, just he turns and says, so what do you need? What's your greatest need, son? And uh, this guy, Russ, kind of caught him off guard, the question. Uh, well, mm, uh, uh, well, he said, uh, he's thinking in his head, we need washing machines, we probably need this and that. He said, but what we really need is we want to build a brand new school because the public school system here is awful, the kids are poor, they don't get a good education, and uh, we want to build it right over there. And there was this old beat-up old building they were kind of using for a little Christian school. And the guy said, all right, well, how much is that going to cost? Russ, again, deer in the headlights. Uh, uh, he said, oh, $85,000. Guy looked at him, thought for a minute. I'll never forget. He just walks over to his truck, pulls out his checkbook, and writes us a check right there for $85,000. Just like that. I was blown away. I just couldn't believe it. And when he drove off, I said to Russ, why did you say $85,000? <laughs> Where'd you get that number? He goes, I don't know, it's just like off the top of my head. He should have said $150,000. <laughs> but you see, what my point is that when I think back on that story, for that guy, 85000 as I got to know him, I realized, oh, that was easy. I mean, it wasn't, it's never easy to give away money, but... But I think we find, we, we look for this place where we bargain with God. God, how could I just give enough to kind of keep you off my back? Kind of keep the guilt level down. And God's trying to flip it on us and say, no, no, how can I shift your heart and trust that I can trust you with wealth knowing you'll use it to expand the kingdom of God? It's two different ways of looking at life. How can I get you to slow down and let go of this fear that you won't be taken care of so that I can trust you with more? That it could flow through your hands. And we want to start big. We want to say, oh, well, if I had a million, then I'd surely, I'd sign that check for 85000 No, we wouldn't. God starts right where we are, right where we are. He starts small because it's not a question of quantity. Here's why uh, we won't apologize for talking about this. Uh, The only thing I will apologize for is not doing it enough. That's because um, God doesn't want a percentage. He doesn't want an offering. We're asking too little, not too much. Mm. He wants your whole life. Your whole life. Why? Because he gave his whole life for you. And, and listen, in that scale, his was worth a lot more. Eternal, son of God, only begotten of mm. the Father, his blood shed on the cross for us, and what he turns around and asks for is, would you pick up your cross and follow me? Would you become a living sacrifice? Would you call me Lord? What does that mean? That means everything. I don't just pull off one check and give it to him. I say, this is all yours. This is all yours. I live in obedience to you. We give, listen, we give because that is the way God has chose to advance his kingdom. And we've, I could tell you story after story after story how people have given some amount of money and because of that, a cupboard is full of groceries. Someone has decided, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this amount of money and we got a, a girl named Jamie overseas sharing the gospel right now with people that would not be hearing it if that person hadn't done that. We got a, a woman who buried her husband yesterday. You guys came up with the money to pay for that funeral, to take care of three months of her rent. God's kingdom is advanced when we open up our generous eyes and see what God can do through us if we allow him to. You can walk around and look at everything we own as a church, as a community, and if you find some excess then I want you to come talk to me. But you're not going to find gold-plated bathroom fixtures and you're not going to find hot tubs. You're going to find a building and and stuff 
that we use and abuse every single day. Six days a week, there's four to 500 people in our buildings. And we have to build a new one next year. We have a Christian school that we train and disciple young people to go out into the world to make a difference. And we need a high school building. We're bursting at the seams. If you come around Monday through Friday, you'll see a side of church on the hill that you maybe have never seen before. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So everything we do, we want to be, we want to be efficient. We want to use it for the glory of God, but I don't, it's not, we're not building a museum or, or a tour of homes. We need the stuff. And people think, well, you really don't need the stuff to have a church. So try that logic on yourself sometime. Well, I don't really need to have a house to have a home. <laughs> yes, you do. You do, because you can have Christmas dinner at home or you can have Christmas dinner down in Bush Park. Tell me the difference, <laughs> right? So we know instinctively stuff makes our lives go around, but we don't live for the stuff. We use the stuff to be community. We use the stuff to be family. The second reason we're generous is because we recognize we're in a battle. And the battle is against greed and self-indulgence. And when I give, I'm making a statement. This world is not my home. The stakes are high. Wealth is dangerous. So I'm not going to let it tell me what to do. I'm going to tell it what to do. The third reason is... We give because of who we belong to, because of who we belong to. I'm not going to allow a cynical world to determine my generosity. If I go to a restaurant and the service is poor and the server is angry and the service is, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow that person to determine my generosity. I'm going to tip, I don't care who you are. See, I'm not going to say, well, you did me wrong, so I'm going to do you wrong. You were small, so I'm going to be small. No, no. No, because that's, that's not who my father is. It says in Luke 12, Fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Hear that? Hear how generous he's been with us? Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Now, if we, Because hear what's happening. If we understand how generous he's been with us, then that is not a big ask. That's, it's a very little ask. Sell your stuff, give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Look at that first line. We have a shepherd, we have a father, and we have a king. Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We have a father, a shepherd, and a king. The ushers are going to pass out communion while we finish with the song we're going to take together before we finish um, this morning. You guys can come on up and or come, begin to pass out. If you could just hold on to the elements until everybody is served, and then we'll, we'll take together after this song. <laughs> 